Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South, I'm Chris Cooper. Armadillos like to eat bugs, but in the process, they can tear up your yard. We are going to show how to trap them. Also, everyone loves seeing butterflies in the garden. Today, we are going to talk about monarchs. That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Mr. D. Howdy, howdy. And Mary Smith will be joining me later. All right, Mr. D. I see we have a trap here. <laughs> we have a trap. <laughs> what are we trying to trap? Armadillos. 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 Okay. All right. Fortunately, armadillos aren't the smartest critter in the world. Okay. <laughs> uh, you don't even have to bait an armadillo trap. You just need to be where they are. Okay. And you need to understand a little bit about their habits and 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 they tend to go along barriers okay. until they find grub worms. That's what they're looking for. Right. And when they find grub worms, they start going crazy and they will aerate your lawn oh, they would more, tear it up. more than you want it aerated. I know that I guarantee that. One thing we've learned is because armadillos aren't that smart, <laughs> if you uh, attach wings to a regular uh, trap, uh, they will go along and they'll bump one of the wings and they'll go the other direction, bump the other wing and, and you just kind of keep <laughs> going back and forth and they'll go on in the trap. and. And, and, and so you really don't even have to use bait. Wow, if you if you want to use bait, uh, a rotten fruit is one of the things that might work, not because they like fruit, uh, because they like the maggots and the worms that are in that rotten fruit. Ah, okay. And so Makes you sense. could use rotten fruit if you wanted to. Uh, I don't think it's really necessary. Yeah, so no bait, but, okay. But we've got the wings here ready to go, and you can use either a one by four or a one by six, and six feet long is, is long enough. I'm going to drill a couple of holes in them so that I can uh, use wire or cable tie to attach them to the trap. Sure. Okay, gotcha. How about that? There you go. Uh, I think that worked. There you go. There you are. Yeah. Now that actually look like, looks like we, <laughs> we measured it and got the exact same measurements right there, correct? Man, that worked just... Yep. Okay. All right. Well, let's set these aside just a little bit. Okay. I'll let you let you hang on to those. Yeah. And uh, we're going to set it up first uh, over by a fence. And it's it's good to, you know, armadillos tend to go along barriers. So if you have a fence where they're creating damage, set it up close to the fence. Uh, or a line of shrubs or a ditch or something like that would be good. And then, but if, if they're just out there in your yard and you don't, and, and they're doing quite a bit of damage, we know you, you probably got grub worms, mm -hmm. then just set it up and, 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 and we, we use both wings. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and set it up right over here, okay. something like this. And I'm, I'm gonna actually use the fence as one of my wings. Okay. And uh, hang that right there. So let me go ahead, let me have one of those boards. And I'm gonna set it up, something like that right there. And on this side, I think I'm just gonna wire it on. I, this is a pretty good piece of wire. Uh, I think I've got That's pliers awesome. right there. Look at that. Got it. Yeah. Don't have to be that don't have to be do anything fancy there. Okay now let me have, do one more. Got it. How about that? Mm. Yep. Now 
That's that. That's what I said. You don't have to. Don't. I mean, they're not gonna. They're not good at untying stuff. I don't think. <laughs> the way you set these traps, they've got a mechanism here to keep this from coming back. You have to lift that mechanism and let that slide back. Then I'm gonna go down and grab the door. Continue sliding it out of the way. Need to make sure that that will close. It's catching a little bit on there. Let me come back out a little bit. I want to make sure that the wire is not going to impede the door shutting. That. Let's see that one. Oh. Test it to make sure it'll work. Uh huh. Ah. I think Voila. it worked. It'll work. So what happens? You catch the armadillo, then what? You need to check with your local authorities. Check, uh, check with the local wildlife folks. Uh, in a lot of areas, it's illegal to transport wild animals, so. Uh, what you check and see what you can't do. Okay. And uh, if you can't transport them, uh, and, and then it's not a good idea to transport them anyway because you're giving your problem to somebody else. So, oh boy. just do what, you know, man's got to do what a man's got to do. You know, <laughs> <All right. laughs> figure out some way to dispatch them. All right. Uh, but, uh, and if you've got one, you probably have three more because they have, armadillos have one litter per year. They are, from one egg, they're identical quadruplets. Either they'll have four males or four females. Okay. So if you get one, you, got some you may have two or three more. Mm. Okay. Unless they get taken out on the highway. And when are they most active? They, from twilight until just after sunrise during the summertime. Yeah. During the wintertime, they're active during the daytime. During the daytime, how about that? Yeah. Okay. okay. I want to pull it up and I'm going to move it over here and attach the other wing and show you kind of how it'll look okay. when you have it set up outside. So. We'll use zip ties on the other side. It might be, uh, it might work a little bit better. Got We've it. already got our holes drilled. Mm -hmm. There it goes. That out of the way. Oh yeah. Yeah. That really works better than the yeah. wire because a whole lot better. these are out of the way. Right. Even though I don't think it's gonna be a problem here. I'm gonna raise this again. I'm wearing gloves, yes. not so much to keep from injuring me, but just I guess a it's a habit of mine to always wear gloves when I'm dealing with any kind of traps to uh, maybe mitigate the human scent a little bit. Okay. But uh, I'm gonna actually open this up a little bit more. So there you are. That is it. If you have an armadillo trap that's set up. We're gonna make sure it works now. Let's make sure it works. Yeah, make sure it works. There he goes. Got like him. That. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good sound that. to hear if uh, if you have the windows up at night and <laughs> you hear that that noise, you know you, you caught your trip, caught there your you critter. Got. Mr. D, appreciate that demonstration. That was pretty good, man. Good I like deal. that. Yeah. Thank you much. What we have here is a nice thick stand of dove weed. Yes, dove weed. As you can see here, it is really taking over the Bermuda in this area. Dove weed is a summer weed. It's a summer annual weed. It actually grows by stolons. Dove weed produces a purple flower, as you can see here. It is not a grass weed, though. It is different. It's related 
uh, to some of your lilies. How do you control dove weed? There's a couple of ways. Culturally, a thick stand of Bermuda would definitely crowd out this dove weed. For a post-emergent, you have to use a three-way herbicide because again, this is more of a broadleaf weed instead of a grass weed. So something that contains 2,4-D, uh, dicamba will work as well. So again, dove weed, which is a late summer weed. All right, Mary, so monarchs, can you give us a little brief life history of the monarchs? Sure. Um, monarchs are a large butterfly that people see often in their gardens, um, and it's really charismatic and colorful, mm -hmm. um, and it has a unique life history, too. It's a migrating butterfly, which there's a few that migrate, but what's really interesting about the monarch is it only migrates um, to Mexico every fourth generation. Okay. Um, wow. And that super generation, as we call it, lives um, maybe four to six months, where most of the ones that we see are only living a few weeks. Um, so it's a really unique butterfly that unfortunately is uh, in decline wow. in the eastern United States. Um, so what's really important, um, and I think we'll talk about it in just a minute, okay. is how to attract them to your own backyard. Okay. Why the decline, though? Well, the decline is for a couple different reasons. One of it um, is a loss of overwintering habitat in central Mexico due to some illegal logging, uh -huh. um, which we can't do a lot about that. But what we can do is we're losing a lot of what the caterpillars eat, which okay. is milkweed. And so we've lost a lot of that habitat. Um, and also weather can really affect monarchs too. Um, and so cold winters in Mexico mm. and then during migration can affect them too. So those are the main reasons okay. why the population Good. has declined. Okay. So let's talk a little bit more about the life cycle. Okay. So the life cycle is pretty unique. Um, one monarch butterfly can lay about uh, two to 300 eggs. Wow. And what's okay. really amazing about that too is they only lay one egg per leaf. So just one <laughs> wow, monarch yeah. needs a lot of milkweed yeah. to lay the eggs. Um, a few days after they lay the eggs, they hatch and turn into a caterpillar. Okay. And that caterpillar, over about a two weeks time, is going to grow about 2,000 times its original size. And how they wow. do that is they're going to be just eating away at milkweed. And so they go through about five stages or five instars, which is the stage um, in between their molts. And um, they're just eating, eating, eating and getting bigger. Um, and then after about two weeks, they're going to form what we call a J-shape. So they're going to find either the underside of a leaf or uh, maybe even a pot or under the eaves of your house. <laughs> and they're going to um, form a chrysalis. Okay. And so a chrysalis is a little bit different than a cocoon. A cocoon is what a moth forms. And a chrysalis is what a butterfly forms. How about that? That's so, so neat. Yeah, so this is a newly formed chrysalis just formed over the last couple of days. This is a monarch chrysalis. And what happens is they undergo a number of changes inside of this chrysalis. And after mm. about 9 to 14 days, they're going to emerge as the adult butterfly. Nine, 14 days. Nine to 14 days. So the whole process from egg to adult butterfly usually takes about a month. Hmm. So this is a really unique chrysalis too, as we were talking about earlier. Most of the chrysalis are really camouflaged. So they're gonna be brown or look like a crinkled up leaf, whereas hmm. the monarch is a little bit different. It's this bright green, it's got some gold accent on it. Um, and just really, to me, it looks like a really nice piece of jewelry. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, <laughs> does. it um, sure does. So, that, um, so they're just undergoing some changes inside there and um, turning into a butterfly. Okay. Wow, it's a beautiful butterfly. Yes. Like that. Yeah. Another really unique thing about the monarch um, is that you can actually tell the males from the females. Okay. And a lot of butterflies, there's not much of a difference, but in monarchs, you can tell the difference between the males and the females. And so males are going to have two scent pouches, which are here and here. Hmm. Um, the females do not have those scent pouches. So it's pretty neat. You can tell the difference between the males and the females just by those two black spots there. And that's it. That's it. Wow. Oh, okay. 
Yeah, both going to be about the same size. Um, both visit um, the same types of flowers, but just those two scent pouches are the difference. Oh, okay. So how do we attract these wonderful butterflies okay. to our garden? I love talking about this because sure. we've lost so much um, habitat. What we can do is we can plant things to attract them in our own backyards. Okay. The number one thing you want to plant if you want to attract monarchs is milkweed. Okay. And milkweed gets its name because if you pull a leaf off, mm -hmm. it has kind of a um, milky sap that comes out. And that's actually really important for the caterpillar because it contains a toxin that makes the caterpillar taste really bad to predators like birds. Uh -huh. um, and so that's what the monarch caterpillars are eating. And so we have a variety of different milkweeds here in the Mid-South that do really well. Um, this one here that the caterpillar's on is yes. a common milkweed. Okay. And if you've got the space, this is a great one. Um, it not only serves as a plant that the caterpillars eat, but the adult butterflies will also visit visit the plant whenever it's blooming. Okay. Um, so common milkweed, it does get kind of tall. It can get about five to six feet, but it does get a nice ball, um, pinkish purple bloom on it. Another one, this is a non-native plant, but a lot of people like this one. It's a tropical milkweed. Um, it grows really fast and it blooms um, throughout the summer. The one thing um, you may wanna do um, is clip off the flowers in maybe late September, October. Mm -hmm. um, and that will um, keep the monarchs moving south okay. um, during their migration. We also have a swamp milkweed, mm -hmm. our rose milkweed, uh, green antelope horn milkweed, uh, butterfly weed. This is one that has the bright orange flowers. It's more low growing. Um, maybe Pretty about colors. two feet. My goodness. That's, yeah. that's UT orange. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah, UT orange. There you go. <laughs> Um, in addition to the milkweeds, the milkweeds are going to attract the females to lay their eggs as well as a nectar source. You want to look at some nectar sources, especially fall blooming ones that are going to get monarchs as they're migrating south. Okay. And so some things as they're first getting to Memphis, things like Coreopsis, Mistflower, Yarrow, um, Pickerel weed, if you have an, a pond or a water feature. Those are great um, spring blooming ones. And then in the fall, you want to look at things like blazing star, bee balm, mm, okay. um, button bush. Those are all going to be nectar sources. Goldenrod. Yeah, goldenrod. Golden yeah, okay. absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the benefit to planting those too is you're not going to just attract monarchs, but you're going to attract a variety of different butterflies as well. Okay. Wow. So growing conditions, full sun? Yeah, most milkweeds are going to be full sun. Mm -hmm. um, so if you've got a nice sunny spot, um, some of them do okay in pots. I've grown the tropical in pots before, um, but a lot of them do great in the ground and they're going to come back year after sure. year. Sure. So how many generations again? Well, there's about four to five generations. It starts with the first generation that is migrating um, from Mexico to maybe the Texas coast. And then each subsequent generation moves a little bit further north until they get about to the Canadian border, which is the northern limit of milkweed. Okay. Um, that fourth or fifth generation is a super generation. And that generation is going to migrate all the way down to central Mexico. Um, passing through Memphis, usually we peak in late September, um, early October. All right, well, we appreciate that information again, but I do like super generation. I think that's pretty neat. <laughs> yeah. Thanks again, Mary. Appreciate Thank that. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to do something that I don't normally do. I'm going to pull out my pruning shears in early September. Not an ideal time to prune, but you're going to understand why I'm not afraid to do that with these, this blackberry. It, it looks a little rough right now because the flora canes have already died. So any time is okay to prune when you're removing dead tissue. But I'm not going to do anything to the primal canes until late winter. And I'm going to be very careful as I remove the flora canes because I don't want to damage any of this young tender tissue. And that's really easy to do if you just cut the floor cane at the bottom and you try to drag it out of the trellis. I'm going to take it out in pieces so that I don't damage any of my young tender foliage. There is one other thing you can do pretty much any time. Get these long shoots, help support them a little bit, kind of direct them in the direction that you want them to go, and that might make them survive the winter winds 
a little bit better. Just gonna kind of thread them through here. You can actually tie them up if you like, but that's pretty much all I want to do with my blackberries this time of the year. All right, Mr. D. It's a Q&A segment. You ready? I'm ready. Great questions. Great Thank questions. You. Here's our first via email. Hello, Dr. Chris. I live in southeast Louisiana in zone nine. I planted a passion fruit vine almost three years ago from seed. This year is the first year it produced flowers, but still no fruit. What am I doing wrong? I regularly fertilize once a month. Do I need to plant two different plants together to help pollinate each other? Please help. Mr. James from New Orleans, Louisiana. All right, so a couple of things here for me about the passion fruit vine. I know a little bit about that, right? Depends on the variety. There are some varieties that are self-fertile. Exactly. Okay. So if you don't have that, then you have the ones that are not self-fertile, which will need help with pollination. Right. Right. So and poor pollination or lack of pollinators would be the issue. That's probably the issue mm -hmm. here. When you've got the yep. pretty flowers like that pretty and flowers, no fruit, then that tells you. That tells you everything you need to know. And I'll tell you something else, too, that he did mention that I would say don't do. Regularly fertilize once a month. It's going to be too much. You're probably pushing it a little bit too much. That's going to be pushing too much. And yeah, we don't know what he's fertilizing with, but if it has any nitrogen in it, that's going to be a bit much. That could be a problem too. That's going to be a problem. But I think you got it on the first one. I, mean, I, I pulled up a publication from Florida okay. about passion fruit. And uh, it says... Did it, did it uh, back me up? <laughs> I'm going to back you up. Good. Yeah, I'm going to back you up. Uh, pollination is essential for fruit yeah. production. Some of the There are some of the varieties that are self-fruitful. Right. But uh, yeah, purple passion fruit oh, flowers okay. are self-fruitful. So if you pull that up, you notice that is not purple. Right. Uh, while many purple yellow hybrids, uh, they are, are may not be, yeah, probably right. aren't. And then the, the, the yellow ones are definitely not. That had some yellow in it. And they do require pollen from a compatible vine that is genetically different. Yeah. So don't get another one just like that. Right. I think it's you, need, you need to get one that's different. Across pollination. Uh, yeah, get you some pollinators. Yeah, yeah. plant you some uh, plants that the bees like, and maybe the bees can come by and do that. If not, you have to do it yourself. Yeah, even carpenter bees, it, uh, this says, uh, uh, will we'll, uh, we'll, we'll do the trick. But oh, okay. hand pollination with a clean cotton ah, there you go. or a paintbrush. Yeah. 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 Labor from, intensive. Yeah, from the anther to the stigma. Mm -hmm. uh, so there that's you fun. have it. So thank you, mm -hmm. Mr. James. We appreciate that question and a beautiful picture. Yeah, oh, yeah. Thank you much. That's Pretty. real nice. All right, here's our next viewer email. Mr. D, I know you like this one. <laughs> Do you have any advice on keeping squirrels from eating all my peaches? Callie and Bowie, Maryland. So do you have any advice for Miss Callie here? We looked Bowie, Maryland up. Okay. Yeah, we looked it up. <laughs> uh, and we noticed that you're in a, a suburban area that probably doesn't allow shooting. But my first, I mean, I even have a note down here, 12 year old <laughs> with a 20 gauge, you know, that's the best thing, the best thing out there for, for squirrels. And now that I understand you're in a suburb, suburban right. area, like, you know, like we're here in Memphis, Tennessee, right. and it's kind of like that too. Mm -hmm. That complicates things a little bit. Um, there are some really, really good pellet guns out there. Uh, you might want to check with your local authorities first right. and, and find out whether or not you can, uh, you can uh, you discharge a firearm in your area. If you can, uh, shooting them is a good way to do it. Uh, it's one of the best ways. And if you can shoot them with a shotgun, that's really good because <laughs> it's hard to miss. Uh, then uh, I probably wouldn't use a rifle uh, unless I'm in a completely rural area, right, a 22 right, rifle or right. something like that. But a 20 gauge shotgun with with a light load ammo is, is most excellent. Now, if you can't do that, I've tried the pellet gun, yeah, the but pellet. I would also I would do some trapping. Mm. Okay. Uh, you can take one of your peaches and put it in a trap down <laughs> at the base of the tree and see if you have a lazy squirrel that would <laughs> rather go in a trap and get it. Uh -huh. uh, uh, is there anything else you can bake the trap with outside of peaches? Uh, yeah, nuts. nuts. They might yeah. prefer a pecan or, oh, or yeah, uh, yeah. You, know, they, they, you know, they really like it. <laughs> but I don't know. Peach is hard to beat. You know, yeah, even I a squirrel might prefer a peach yeah, over a pecan. But uh, it's just tough. So tough. You know, yeah, you, can try, you can try, you can try, you can get the sticky stuff that you can paint on the trunk of the tree. Oh, yeah, okay. You know, you might want to try that. Uh, uh, but your options are limited. 
mm -hmm. if you if you can't uh, you know trap them and you know get rid of them. Uh, it's gonna be limited. Jack Kelly. Russell, you got <laughs> a dog Russell. that you could kind of put your dog right yeah. out there, you know, tether it yeah. out uh, <laughs> under the tree, you know, to to the peaches get right. You know, uh, I say a Jack Russell. You may want to get you a Rottweiler, yeah. or, or, you know, but a Jack Russell will do do the trick. I mean, they'll they'll take care of the squirrel. Uh, yeah. But I, you know, that's a tough one. It's always tough, isn't it? That's yeah. a tough one, and it's not Especially only tough city. for peaches. It's tough for you know pears and apples and things like you know squirrels are, yeah, and, and they 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 it doesn't take them long mm -hmm. to get them all. Mm -mm. You know, they get a taste of them and and. Uh, they go tell their neighbors, I think, and they come in there and they harvest them. And, uh, <laughs> and they'll come and get them. Sometimes they may just take a bite out of one and, and just drop and it and grab another it. one. Oh, yeah, yeah, that is yeah. so tough. So yeah, it's gonna no, be no. tough. I feel, I feel your pain. Yeah, it's gonna be tough. Pain. So thank yeah. you for the question. Yeah. It's deep fun as always. Thank you, huh? sir. Yep. All right. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplot at wkno.org. And the mailing address is Family Plot 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for joining us. If you want to learn more about controlling critters in your garden or learn how to attract monarch butterflies, head on over to familyplotgarden.com. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.